the figure drawing session at the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. Normally we have four hours to draw the model. Today it's going to be a bit shorter because I want to give a presentation first. And this presentation is about drawing. It's about drawing on toned paper. And we've been doing this for a few years now and we found that we prefer the toned paper because it allows more gradations, faster, uh, and we've been working in that way. So these are just a series of principles that I've come across while drawing, and it's more practical principles about what to do. So you'll sit down, you'll have the model. This is actually a good example because our model today will be assuming the pose of this classical model from uh, the French academies in the 1800s. And the first question you'll ask yourself, this is a drawing by Gustave Moreau, by the way, is do I turn my paper horizontally? Do I turn my paper vertically? A very simple question, but something that you might forget to do. And uh, look at the figure and ask yourself, what's the best orientation for your page for what you want to do? Maybe Moreau thought that he would actually have two drawings, so he decided to work it up on a horizontal. But uh, a figure like that is actually much more vertical and he you know, would have been better off to have his page vertical. After that, mark the limits of the figure so it's well placed on the page. In other words, kind of tell yourself, well, given where I'm sitting and given the model and so on, uh, where are the feet going to go roughly, where is the head going to go? And try to stick basically to that, you know, not religiously, but basically to the orientation of what you want to do. Very simple principles. Uh, Moreau, it's interesting to see, was focusing on the anatomy underneath the figure. He was thinking about the shoulder and what's going on in the shoulder and where the specific bumps are, the skeleton. He's a classically trained artist and he is aware of those things, the anatomy. Here's another very basic principle. Uh, next week I'll be talking about proportion of the human figure where we'll see that there's a whole series of different ways that you can measure out the figure. But the most simple way, and this is the ideal, everyone is different in terms of their actual proportions, the ideal figure is eight heads high. And if that's the case, that means the nipples, the pubis, and the knees, and I call that the NPK system, just as a shorthand, that halfway is the pubis. That's called the pubis, where the sex basically starts. And that will be your halfway point from here, right? Halfway. And then divide that in half again, you get not the knees, but the bottom of the knees. And the bottom of the knees is basically happening halfway. Um, and then next, the nipples will also be halfway between the pubis and the top of the head. So very simple NPK system. And as I was surfing the internet, I came across this drawing, which was from Christie's. It was on auction. It's from the School of Raphael. It had nothing to do with uh, proportion, per se. But this drawing that was on sale at Christie's happened to show these four or three vertical lines dividing the figure into four separate parts exactly at the pubis, below the knees, and roughly the nipples. So I think that they understood that as a principle for quite a long time. And da Vinci, when he laid out his Vitruvian man, he also uh, divided the figure into these four basic parts. Right? So as landmarks on the body to think of, think that is this roughly halfway, is this roughly halfway between the top and the midpoint? and are the bottom of the knees roughly halfway down. Same thing with the skeleton, don't forget about it, that there's a skeleton underlying all that flesh and muscle, and uh, that's what gives us bulges in certain places, and especially the structure of the pelvis, and the structure of the rib cage. Be aware that this is one fairly solid, voluminous mass, the rib cage and the pelvis, another fairly solid, voluminous mass. And I should sense that it's there. The bones, you're not going to sense too much. They're buried too deeply, although you might see them coming through in places like this. 
but definitely there are places where bones come through and watch for those places. So the skeleton underneath the skin. I'll go into more detail about this drawing that I made a few years ago, but what I'm trying to illustrate by copying this uh, ignudo, as it's called from Michelangelo, is the way certain muscles are tensed and certain muscles are relaxed. All the muscles in this leg are relaxed because it's kind of hanging off the edge of this seat he's on. Because the muscles are relaxed, they're fairly simple to draw, right? Whereas these muscles are tense, that you can really feel it. The toe is bending over here, and as there's more tension, there's more bulges in the muscles. And I want to feel that tension and bulging in the muscles when you're drawing, as opposed to the simply more relaxed kind of lines. So remember, tension and relaxation in the muscles showing will and repose in the figure, which is a fundamental uh, principle for Western art. Now, you're going to start drawing, and what are you going to do? My suggestion is that you sketch in the figure lightly, concentrating on the whole rather than the details. We're talking about a drawing where you have the model in front of you. When you're doodling on your own, or you're wanting to draw a figure, if you want to start from the eye, and then do the eye, and then the nose, and then the mouth, and the ear, and the head, and start working your way, that's fine. That's the way a lot of people draw, and it's fun. But if you're trying to render what's in front of you, you're not going to start doing those details until you've gotten the whole thing. And you should really kind of... Some people prefer to block in. Blocking in means using straight lines and using all these series of straight lines to try and get the basic position of all these things. Myself, I'm not so much in favor of blocking in, but everyone has their preference. I'm more in favor of smooth, flowing, overall gesture to capture the essence and movement of what's in front of you. But everyone has their preference, as I said. Again, search for a cohesive movement in the whole figure. And you can see Raphael, who's a master draftsman, he's very much aware of the entire movement within this figure. And he's even drawn these larger lines around it to emphasize that smooth curve that runs through the figure. Uh, here, all this figure's weight is on this foot. There's the plumb line, right? But what he's emphasizing is the movement around the plumb line, and that's this curve that's going like this. Now, we're hard to find a model that's going to stand like that for four hours, so you probably won't have a figure like that. But we have sitting figures, and they are moving on the platform in a certain way. <clears throat> so look for that movement, that cohesive movement, that runs through the whole figure. And then start drawing. And what are you going to draw? My thing is that you draw eggs. I used to draw outlines because I love outlines. And I realized after a while that my outlines weren't matching up properly. And as soon as I started drawing eggs, suddenly all my outlines started to match up. Because when you're looking at the volumes of things, and you're drawing the volumes of things, when it comes to doing the outline, then this curve and this curve are going to match up. Because you've already kind of given yourself the, the cohesion in that volume. So I strongly suggest that you draw eggs to create a figure. You can see that, I guess this is Raphael that Raphael has been doing that pretty much throughout the figure, <clears throat> and it serves him very well. Another thing about drawing the figure, and here's Raphael again, is that there are very few concave lines in the figure. We're looking for volume typically, and to express volume, we're going to be using these convex lines, C lines, as they're called and use as many C lines or convex lines as you can, even when you get into a little place in here, right? And you might say to yourself, oh, okay, now I want to do a convexity, uh, sorry, a concavity, right? He doesn't. He has one C hitting another C hitting another C. Everything is rounded. He doesn't 
tuck that one in and give you a concavity. You, may, you might, might find them on occasion. I'm not saying they don't exist at all. But the majority are these convex lines. Just a principle to keep in mind. <clears throat> a beautiful drawing of St. Catherine uh, by Raphael. And now, again, I'm giving you my uh, preference, but save shading until later. Some artists do like to start shading fairly quickly and getting the general light and dark uh, disposition in space. That's fine. Uh, my recommendation is that you kind of get a sense of where everything is going to go in your drawing before you start focusing on dark and light, because there are certain principles involved in dark and light, and we'll talk about those principles. But before you can apply those principles, you kind of have to know where things end and where things begin. Negative space. Someone pointed it out to me during the classes here, and I never forgot it. It was a very valuable lesson. Where is the negative space in this figure? Here. Right? And again, here. You may be focusing so much on getting those legs and all those nice muscles and then getting those curves and so on, and after you spend an hour on that, you'll look at your drawing and go, oh, wait a minute, this leg is totally going down here and it should be back here. And the, the negative space is going to help you to focus on the distance between things. And always kind of be aware of the negative space and look for those places where there's negative space and ask yourself, is the distance from the elbow to the hip correct? Is the distance from that ankle to this ankle correct? And when you ask yourself those questions, you'll start to adjust and become more aware of where things actually are in the figure. <clears throat> This is one of my favorite. Eggs lead to counterbalancing C curves. You were a good student, you drew your eggs, and you drew, and when I say eggs, I will typically draw, say like, maybe a big one here, and then smaller one there, smaller one here, right? Pretty large here. Obviously it's not here, it's very, very oval. A large one, a large one, right? Those hips are a whole mass. Get it in there. Those ribs are a whole mass. Get it in there. Shoulders, shoulders, right? head. <clears throat> and once you've done that, you'll start to realize that there are certain lines that end and get picked up again as it goes around the body. And I love looking for those ones. They're all over the figure, right? This one comes in and then it gets picked up again over here. And even that, you could say, gets picked up again down here. So there was always these C curves, or what I call counterbalancing C curves, which end up becoming S's, and there's these S's moving around the figure. And watch for them, because it'll help you to orient the proportions. <clears throat> Cut important volumes into the figure's silhouette. Once that muscle is tensed and it's emphasized, it's going to cut into the silhouette. And there's places where things cut in. If you're drawing silhouettes and you're just doing that all the time, you're not going to get that part that cuts in. And just be aware of wherever you want to cut into the silhouette, right? To give yourself those, those points and marks and so on. <coughs> So uh, here's a good example of what goes on when lines cross. That uh, you have this curve over here, but it doesn't end nowhere. It keeps on going and gets picked up by that curve, and it doesn't just stop here. It keeps on going and gets picked up by that curve. And there's always curves that make a cohesive movement to the figure that you're looking for. And that can happen in the profile or it can happen in the frontal view. And we saw this one happening over here already. And it goes on all over the figure. And I think an artist like Raphael was very much aware that a line over here gets picked up by another line over there. Or this curve over here gets picked up as well. Right? 
and that that shoulder is not just arbitrarily placed. He wants that shoulder to be picked up, pick up the movement that's happening over here. <clears throat> and it's a good lesson because once you see it happening in the figure that you're drawing, that's in front of you, when you start designing the figures with no reference, and I think a good artist should be able to draw at this level without even a model, uh, you, you're aware that these are principles for construction, principles for creating the figure. <clears throat> now you're going to start shading. And the big no-no is to go too deep, too fast. You want to keep your shading light in the beginning. You don't want, and you can block in larger areas of shading if you want to, but lightly. And uh, once you've blocked in larger areas of shading, then you can start to come back and make it a little bit darker and so on. But uh, do not strive for your darkest dark, uh, your core shadow, right away. Now again, uh, some artists will give themselves a dark mark at a certain point to tell themselves, there's my core shadow, I'm going to have to get to that dark level of darkness eventually. But I wouldn't start putting those dark marks all over your drawing. You know, you've, you've uh, hit the end before you've really reached the midway point. Because the end is when you go for your highest highlights and your darkest darks. <clears throat> Shade the background to create light before dark. And when we teach monochrome underpainting here at the academy, we have a, a rule or an expression that has to, you have to ask yourself at least a hundred times as you're painting. You ask yourself, is it light before dark or is it dark before light? And you just say to yourself repeatedly, dark before light, light before dark. In other words, I want to shade in this figure. And I ask myself, okay, well, if that's light, it's light against what? Well, it's light against dark, so I need to make my background darker. And then uh, you will find other places where you have dark before light, okay? Uh, so you're constantly asking yourself, is it dark against light? Is it light against dark? And you're only going to get the light against dark by shading in the background. Granted, with tinted paper, it's even more variable. But don't forget to shade your background to bring stuff forward. If you're focusing on the drawing your figure, drawing your figure, and you leave the background alone, that's never going to pop forward, right? Although, again, as I said, the tinted paper is going to help you that way. <clears throat> and, of course, situate the model in the environment. You know, I ignore some of the details behind the model because they're not interesting, but other, you know, what's he standing on? What's he sitting on? Where's the horizon? Those things should be marked basically in your drawing to help you orient and give the figure an environment. Where are the shadows falling? What are they falling onto? <clears throat> Here's a good, what's called Académie by Gerald Day, any drawing of a nude figure. Uh, was called an Académie because, as we learned this morning, you could only draw the new figure in the academy during the 1700s. Um, <clears throat> leave core shadows and highlights until last. So now you're on tinted paper and now you get to put in those wonderful highlights. And they're so much fun that you might get carried away. I'm guilty of that as well. Leave those highlights with your white pencil until they really come in to, to push that knee forward, for example and leave those dark, dark, dark uh, shadows until you really need them to push that further back under the cushion. So, and as I say here, use the tinted paper for your mid-tone. Here's the mid-tone. He doesn't do a thing. He just uses the tinted paper to be his mid-tone. And the tinted paper is there to help you so you don't have to shade in all this stuff over here because it's already got that tone, that mid-tone. <coughs> So, uh, this is now one of the drawings that I made here, and it's also one of the reasons why we want to do the four-hour pose, because this is probably about an hour and a half, maybe an hour, 
and you'll learn very quickly that within, with an hour you don't have enough time to really do justice to the drawing. So for example, the hair, I just kind of left it because I didn't have time. I didn't really have time to do the background of this drawing, right? Uh, but what I did manage to do is I managed to kind of use the tinted paper as my mid-tone. And the mid-tone is right there between your lights and your darks. And then I didn't overdo it with the darks. There's some shading, right? But uh, very subtle. <clears throat> use the paper. Work with it. I love drawing in museums. And this is a drawing I did in the Princess Darcy's Museum. And now I just want to talk about hatching. Hatching is when you take your pencil and you just do lines to make the shadow. And after a while, hatching can be really fun if you get the hang of it. And if you don't have the hang of it, just sit there with a piece of paper and just make lines because it's just something that comes with the movement of your wrist. And <clears throat> Uh, once you've kind of gotten your hatching down, be aware that you want to hatch at roughly a 45 degree angle. Uh, because if you're going to, I do sometimes hatch like that, but that's to create my cross hatching. First, I'm going to do it like this. <clears throat> and then if you have a, a face where it's got all sorts of different angles and so on, it's not that easy to cross hatch in certain directions. So turn the paper. I know it's, you know it's such a simple, obvious thing, but when you need to hatch in a way that your hand cannot hatch comfortably, turn the paper so you can hatch it and then bring it back. Don't be afraid to move your paper around while you're drawing so that you can easily hatch all the different areas. <clears throat> Another drawing from the Constitutionist Museum in Vienna. And now uh, multiply the hatchings. And as you multiply the hatchings, make sure that they cross each other in a dynamic way. That uh, it's kind of hard to see maybe, but I'm hatching this way down here. But I'm also hatching that way over here. And where they cross, it gets deeper. But you want them to cross each other dynamically, not to cross each other uh, at an angle that's kind of not very emphasized. Not at a perfect 90 degree angle either. 90 degree angles are boring in cross hatching, unless you want to just do a flat background or something. So keep it at dynamic angles. And then don't be afraid to curve around the volume. I remember this drawing because it took me like two hours or three hours and they had the uh, natural light in the Kunstatorisches Museum at that time and the light was shifting over the surface as I was drawing it so that I could actually see that there was less, there was more shadow over here by the time I had finished doing this part over here for example. Uh, try out different kinds of pencils. I go to art stores and I buy sanguine, I buy brown watercolor pencils, I use graphite. They're all different. Some have wax, some have chalk, and different brands and so on. I now have my favorite pencil and I've ordered it, so I have a lot of them, uh, which is this brownish watercolor pencil. But, you know, I'm always interested in trying out different types of pencil just to see what they do for me. And usually, uh, and, and not, I was going to say usually it's a warm tone, but uh, I have used blue pencils in the past, and blue can make an interesting kind of effect as well. So there's a whole range of colored pencils that you can try out. All right, so use the tone paper as the mid tone, especially for light and shadow, and clearly identify your light source to render the whites. Light in shadow, one of those core ideas that we often forget about, but the light's coming here, and the core shadow, you know, where the light hits the darkness, that's where you're going to have the core shadow. And after you have the core shadow, then you start to get light in the shadow. And use that gray tone of your paper to get that light in the shadow. Sometimes I overdo it and I start to put light in there, and it doesn't look very good to be honest. By leaving it behind as the light in the shadow, that's probably the best thing that you can do. 
And then you want to do your whites. Well, think very clearly, where is my light source? And that light is going to hit exactly, boom, one point. And as it hits that point, that's where it's strongest. And then it gets less stronger and less stronger and less stronger and less stronger, right? Although you might want to give it certain points <coughs> and just to bring out that knee or whatever. But over here, it's going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. So, so be aware that your whites should slowly diffuse over the body in different directions because you've got a very precise light source that we're working from. <coughs> This is what I think of as a bad drawing. And it's a bad drawing because I overdid it with the whites. And the volume started to become kind of flat. And the figure, I don't know, it was a hard figure from the beginning just because of all the foreshortening and so on. But uh, if you overdo it with the whites, you're going to end up flattening the volumes and you don't want to do that. So I think it's good to remember to yourself your mistakes and learn from them. Mistakes are good, right? You're going to learn from them. So I'll end off with this one, shade around the figure to create light against dark, which I mentioned before. But, you know, I know that this leg has to receive a certain emphasis. And rather than, I'm just going to use the, the natural tone of the paper and start shading in that negative space underneath there. And that's going to allow light against dark. Right? I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay, light, this is light against dark, and this is light against that dark, right? It's all very relative. And you're constantly seeking out the contrast of light against dark as you go through the figure. Okay, uh, that's really all I want to say about figure drawing, uh, a bunch of principles that we can work from. But uh, hopefully then 